Hello. Today we're going to talk about how to do a fast exam and when it's useful. I'm Sarah Psudi, Emergency Medicine and Ultrasound Faculty at Coopham University Hospital, as well as uh, the Director of Undergraduate Ultrasound at CMSRU. So let's talk historically. So the FAST exam was probably one of the first and most useful exams historically that point of care ultrasound started doing. About 25, 30 years ago, uh, it ended up being that a, the average CT of the abdomen and pelvis took 10 to 15 minutes to complete. And that was 10 to 15 minutes of taking a potentially hypertensive sick trauma patient to CT and waiting there and hoping that they didn't decompensate. So some folks figured out that if you did a bedside ultrasound in a hypotensive blunt abdominal trauma patient and found free fluid, you could likely make the decision that they had serious intra-abdominal injury and take them to the operating room and bypass the CT scanner completely. And that's where most, if not all, of the data of the FAST exam initially came from. Later on, as the CT scanners have gotten quicker, for example, now it takes us 15 minutes to scan from head to toe. People wonder about the utility of the FAST exam in that situation because there is a significant amount of data showing that the FAST exam will only pick up about 250 cc's of fluid. So then you might ask, why do we even talk about this? Why is it an important part of emergency ultrasound still? And I would say that there's a couple of reasons. First and foremost, as volume is rising in uh, urban emergency departments and it's getting harder and harder for patients to get to CT scan expeditiously, it is a significantly useful triage test to help decide which patient needs to go to scan quicker. It's also a scan you can redo at the bedside, so if a patient decompensates, you can get additional information and make decisions based on it. And then finally, if you have the multi-system patient or the undifferentiated shocky patient, it is still a very useful adjunct for you to help figure out which direction you need to be thinking about and going in. So let's talk about how we do it. Use the phased array probe. Uh, you used a curvilinear probe, preferably over a phased array probe, and you have it in the right upper quadrant to start, with the probe marker always pointing towards the head. Now, as a brief overview, when you start doing this, there's four places you look. You look in the right upper quadrant, you look in the left upper quadrant, you look at the pericardial space from the sub xiphoid or the parasternal window, and then finally you'd look in the bladder. Depending on what you're looking for, different people have different approaches. Generally speaking, most of the trauma doctors always want you to start looking at the heart first and then moving on to the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant. And in that situation, it's because pericardial tamponade is what they can fix the quickest and can most likely lead to a good outcome. The way we teach it is that if you have a more selected patient as to why they would be hypotensive, we have a less, if you don't have penetrating trauma, you have a lower likelihood of having pericardial tamponade. So we start right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and then we usually will finish the bladder and go back and do the pericardial effusion. So in the right upper quadrant, probe marker pointed towards the head, curvilinear probe, and then you're going to fan that entire space. Now, this is something from uh, the Ultrasound Gel website, which is a resource I do recommend. They take ultrasound research and they translate it into pretty nice pictorials. The reason I bring this up is not because these numbers are particularly reliable. I don't think they are. But the point here is that for any particular view of the FAST exam, you must take each different area in consideration. What that means is, while technically you may have been taught that the Morrison's pouch is the most useful view, there are cases of just the caudal liver edge having free fluid or the hepatodiaphragmatic space just having free fluid. What that means is you must examine the entire right upper quadrant space in three dimensions. You must examine the entire left upper quadrant space in three dimensions and not just focus on the splenorenal space, which usually has a pretty low sensitivity uh, because of an embryological ligament. And the same thing with the pelvis. So let's jump into it. So here, what you're seeing is there is a curvilinear probe with the probe marker pointed towards the head. So here's head, here's feet. You see that the scanner is sort of going through the entire right upper quadrant space. Back here, you see diaphragm. And that tells you you're seeing the subphrenic space. You're seeing right here is Morrison's pouch between the kidney and the liver. And then all the way down here, you get a very brief glimpse of liver edge of the caudal tip of the liver. Now this is an adequate view of the right upper quadrant and you can't always get one shot that gives you all three spots. As a matter of fact it's rare to get this type of shot. So the other option you have is you can separate it slower and you can get the top half as best as you can of the subphrenic space 
making sure there's nothing between the split uh, between the liver and the diaphragm and then once you've done that you can move on down to the inferior pole of the kidney and Morrison's pouch and scan both of those areas separately and confirm that okay now moving on to the left upper quadrant so you put the probe marker instead of putting it at the mid axillary line like you do in the right upper quadrant you're actually going to go a lot more posterior and superior to try to get a better view of that left upper quadrant now in this setting what you're trying to do is scan through the same space the same way you're going to look in the subphrenic space you're going to look in the splenorenal interface and the paracolic gutter and as I said earlier, the splenorenal space does have a small embryological ligament that prevents that from expanding as quickly as the other spaces. So what you're seeing here is now there's spleen. You see the diaphragm, spleen, and kidney. And now you've examined all three areas. Your paracolic gutter is up there, your subphrenic space is here, and then the space between the spleen and the kidney is right here, all of which looks fine. Now moving on, you can now put the uh, probe down for the bladder. Now in the bladder view you're actually going to do two separate types of views. You're going to do a long axis and a short axis view. So here's a short axis view and you can see that your curvilinear probe, probe marker pointed towards the right, is scanning inferiorly down the pelvic brim and you're looking to see that bladder completely disappear with no free fluid or posterior to it. Now as a reminder this is where you want to be careful of your gain because if you have any amount of gain you have up here it'll look brighter posteriorly. I have this example in here because this isn't the best example. Now as a reminder this view you tend to lose a little bit of that posterior space. So this is more what you want to see. You have the probe in full contact with the skin, you're seeing the bladder and then you're seeing the area posterior to the bladder and you're not overgained. So this makes you feel a little more confident that you have a better view of that bladder. You can rotate the probe 90 degrees and look in the sagittal view as well. And here again, this is an overgained example. And if you were to turn down the gain and make full contact, you wouldn't get this artifact. Okay, now in your subcostal view, what you're trying to do is you're going to have your probe marker pointed towards patient right, and then you're going to examine the pericardial space for fluid. You can do this with a curvilinear probe, and if you have any trouble getting the image, you can always switch to a phased array probe. So here you see there is the pericardium, there is the heart beating strongly within it, and there's no evidence of there being any uh, pericardial effusion. Okay, let's talk through a case. So a young woman comes in with severe abdominal pain, you go in to talk to her, and then she starts to syncopize as you're talking to her, and then rapidly becomes unresponsive. So while you're resuscitating her, you end up doing a quick fast exam. So here, we're doing in the right upper quadrant, you can see just a hint of liver edge there. You can see that extending downwards. Uh, nothing really there. You know, the, the people taking care of her weren't sure if there was a little artifact there, if that was a little bit of free fluid, but probably not enough to make her syncopize, they thought. So they went ahead and looked at her uh, bladder to see if there was any free fluid around there. Didn't see anything there either. They moved back up towards the left upper quadrant after about an and uh, they, they then resuscitated her, came back and finished the rest of the FAST exam about 15-20 minutes later, and then found all of this free fluid right around the left upper quadrant in the paracolic gutter, which made them very concerned that the patient did have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy or some other sort of intra-abdominal disaster. So then they went back and looked at the bladder a little more closely, and once she'd voided some, and they noticed that she had this pregnancy that seemed to be discreet from the uterus. So here you see what looks like a pregnancy, but then now there's uterus, and there's your bladder, in, and this is in the sagittal view. So this was suggestive of the patient having likely a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, and she was taken to the operating room and did well. As your second case, you have a young man who's brought in in a uh, cardiac arrest, uncertain what happened. There was some concern that there may have been an opiate toxidrome involved. He's being resuscitated, and you do get pulses back, but he's persistently hypotensive, so you do a rush exam to try to figure out what's going on. And then in the process of that rush exam, you see this. Now here, the caudal edge of the liver tip has some free fluid, and it wraps around, and then you see it uh, up here as well between the peritoneum and the liver. So if you have any questions or concerns about a FAST exam, please feel free to reach out, and uh, we'll take it from there. Have a good one. Bye-bye.